Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, we're very glad you could join us as we continue a series of virtual programs throughout 2021. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the education department here at the Hall of Fame. Today, though, we're mostly going to be hearing from our senior curator, Tom Schieber. He will be talking about an exciting new book that is just out. It's a Hall of Fame publication. The book is called Picturing America's Pastime, Historic Photography from the Baseball Hall of Fame Archives. Uh, we will take questions for Tom a little bit later on in the program. And to do that, all you have to do is uh, print them or type them out, I should say, in our Zoom group chat room. Just type them in there and we'll do our best to get those questions to Tom later in the program. As we get started, we always want to acknowledge the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. We're able to offer you these virtual programs free of charge uh, because of their uh, generous sponsorship and support. So we do thank the Ford Motor Company. We also thank Tom Schieber, our senior curator, who has a special presentation about the new book. Tom, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you very much, Bruce. Greatly appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, I am Tom Schieber. I'm senior curator at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And today I am going to talk to you about a new book that actually is shipping today. So I guess technically today is our grand opening of this uh, book. Um, First of all, I want to go back to 2013, uh, actually November of 2013, when we opened uh, an exhibit titled Picturing America's Pastime, a snapshot of the photograph collection at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, we began developing that exhibit the previous year in 2012, and I worked with Jenny Ambrose, who was the head of our photo department at the time. And together we tackled kind of a daunting task, which was to select about 50 photographs from a collection uh, of over a quarter, quarter million images to put on exhibit. So if you're doing math at home, that means that something like one out of every 5,000 pictures in our collection would make the cut for the exhibit. Well, we worked diligently for a number of months and we managed to um, whittle down our selections to a couple of hundred photographs, at which point we were stuck. And uh, that's when we gathered the rest of the curatorial team and a couple other staff members and asked them for help in making the final cuts. Um, and that was really a grueling task. Every photo we looked at was just like clearly needed to be in the exhibit. And yet we had to cut those couple hundred down to about 50. But while it was a very difficult process, what it really told us was uh, how impressive the Hall's photo archive really is. And ultimately it resulted in multiple exhibits. One on the wall, like you're seeing right there, that was an exhibit opening picture. Um, and at least one on the proverbial cutting room floor. So um, it was a good news, bad news situation. Tough to make cuts, but I'd rather it be difficult uh, than to be struggling to find good photographs. Well, since that time, the exhibit has been on display in the museum, but an identical version has traveled to various locations around the country. And in fact, as Bruce was mentioning, it's still available to come to your hometown if you'd like it. Um, more about how to get that ha to happen um, later on in the presentation. Well, last year we decided to put together a book based on the exhibit. Uh, I was tasked with taking another look at that cutting room floor, as well as um, a new look at our uh, collection, which has grown over the years and continues to grow. Uh, but this time the goal was uh, even more difficult, which was we wanted to feature nearly three times the number of photographs that seen in the exhibit. So that was a lot of work as well. The resulting book is, as Bruce mentioned, it's titled Picturing America's Pastime, Historic Photography from the Baseball Hall of Fame Archives. And like I said, it's available now. Uh, we can tell you, I'll tell you about how to purchase the book at the end of the presentation, but I figured for the next half hour or so, uh, I'd try and give you a feel for what's in store for you when you visit the exhibit and or when you purchase the book. So sit back, uh, make sure your Zoom screen is as large as possible, uh, which would happily means that the screen showing me is as small as possible. <laughs> so you can see the real stars of the show, which is some of the wonderful photographs from our archives that are featured in the book. So we'll start off with this photo of Yankees pitcher Red Ruffing holding uh, a baseball with his forcing fastball grip. And this is the photo that's on the cover of the book. Um, choosing a cover photo was not easy. Um, how do you choose a photo 
for the cover of this book. Well, um, actually, uh, some of our team felt that the best thing to do would be use a montage of photos, um, sort of highlighting the different kinds of photos that you see within the book. The problem with that is it meant that each of the po pictures on the cover would be rather small, and we wanted the, the cover to really make an impact, even from a distance. So we really felt it was important to have a single photo um, that worked well with the aspect ratio of the cover, and it conveyed the theme of baseball and photographs, and, and really quickly and elegantly and effortlessly evoke baseball. Well, we looked at a lot of different images and um, that we had chosen for the book, and we landed on this one. Um, the neat thing about this is, while it's a picture of Red Ruffing's fastball grip, it's not really about Red Ruffing, and it's really not about pitching. It's about the game and about photography. I mean, it quite literally focuses on the name of the game, baseball. Um, the ball and his hand are reaching out to you, the viewer. So it's really a quintessential baseball photograph. Now, when we originally developed the physical exhibit, we had a plan to pair photos with brief labels that sort of gave um, the photos some context and provided an interesting and, and often unique insight into the images. But after a few drafts of the exhibit script uh, were shared with the curatorial team, they came back and they said, you know, we need something that does a better job of tying these photos together. We need some sort of concept that we can weave throughout the exhibit. Uh, and that was missing. And one thing we had thought about doing was having quotes here and there related to the, um, to the photographs. But we ultimately decided that we would have a photograph for, uh, excuse me, a quote for every single photograph. So some of the quotes were directly related to the photo they're paired with. Others were very indirect. Um, and so that's what we did for the exhibit. And we decided to choose the same kind of concept for the book that's based on the exhibit photos with engaging captions and relevant quotes. Um, and as it turns out for this one, uh, both in the exhibit and the book, we had a perfect quote. It's actually my favorite baseball quote of all time. And that is the very last words of Jim Bouton's famous, or some may say infamous book titled Ball Four. And in that he said, you spend a good piece of your life gripping a baseball. And in the end, it turns out that it was the other way around all the time. So that was a wonderful pairing. The earliest photo in the book is this image of the Atlantic Baseball Club of Brooklyn taken in 1868. Uh, they were a powerhouse club during baseball's amateur era and they dominated throughout much of that decade. The 1868 club specifically had a 47 and seven record. Um, but I thought that for the label, I didn't wanna focus so much on their fielding prowess, you know, the, how they are as a, a baseball club, I wanted to call attention uh, to the club's uniforms. Well, if you look at this photo, it's an old photo, uh, obviously, but if you peer through the over 150 years of dust and cracks and stains and creases and all of this, you'll note the club's very stylish attire. Uh, interesting looking belts, uh, bib front jerseys that were adorned with an elegant old English A. And if you look very closely at the bottom of the photo, you'll see that the bottoms of their blue trousers are tied with small belts. And these were used to help keep their cleats from catching on their loose pant legs. This little innovation actually didn't last very long because starting actually the previous season in 1867, the famed Cincinnati Red Stockings pioneered the use of knickers, which basically eliminated the cumbersome extra length of pants that were catching on cleats. That idea caught on very quickly and the tiny belts kind of went the way of the dodo. But uh, as you'll see throughout the talk, sometimes it's, uh, it's fun to really uh, look at details of the photos. Here's another team photograph. This one was taken about 45 years after that of the Atlantics. Uh, the original in our collection is actually rather large, 13 inches by 21 inches, and it pictures the New York Giants. It was a uh, what's called a premium. It was made available to anyone who sent in 40 Fatima cigarette coupons to the Fatima Cigarette Company. And uh, they would give you a, a picture of whatever team you wanted uh, from 1913. This, In this case, this is an image of the New York Giants taken in spring training of 1913. But if 
if you look very closely, you can see the picture has undergone what I call some early 20th century photoshopping. Now, I'm going to go back and forth between this photo and a photo that was that that it was based on, or one that was very similar. This photo here is the original, although it was taken a few seconds uh, from the other one. If you um, and if you go, if I go back and forth here, you'll see some of the players are moving a little bit. They may be uh, changing the position of their hands or leaning one way or the other, but it's clearly taken within a few seconds. But if you take a look at um, in this photo, the gentleman fourth from left, standing fourth from left, that's uh, Giants coach Wilbert Robinson in the spring training photo. But in the Fatima giveaway, take a look. His head has been replaced by that of pitcher Doc Crandall. I'm sorry, that's actually uh, um, Art Fromm. Uh, so his face is now, that's Art Fromm's face, but originally was Wilbert Robinson. And Doc Crandall, who we see here, see here in the Fatima picture, uh, at top row, third from right, if we count the small mascot there. Uh, in the photo that uh, was actually taken in spring training, that is Josh DeVore. So Josh DeVore was eliminated, and in his place, the head of Doc Crandall was pasted in. There you go. So that Fromm and Crandall, who are not in this picture, they're in the, the Photoshop version, weren't actually members of the Giants at the time. They were playing with different clubs in spring training in 1913, but they came to the Giants in mid-season. So that's why the changes were made. But in the most disturbing bit of whitewashing, and I mean that word, that pun is very much intended here. Um, if we take a look at this picture, you can see seated in front on the ground is a gentleman named Ed McCall, who was a longtime trainer for the Giants. And in the Fatima picture, however, you can see his head has been replaced and actually his entire body has been replaced by Moose McCormick. But if you look very closely, I'll put my uh, my mouse over this. You can see, um, I guess I can't get my mouse up there. Eh, it's not showing up. But if you take a look at uh, Ed McCall, he's wearing a black hat. And take a look, the, you can still see the brim of his hat sort of sneakily peeking out. They didn't get rid of that when they did their Photoshop. And so Ed McCall is still, or at least the ghost of Ed McCall is still in the Fatima photograph that was available if you sent away with 40 of your coupons. Well over 100 years later, this photo uh, was taken by Don Sparks, one of the first black photographers to do assignments on, on a nationwide basis. And he took this photo of White Sox slugger Dick Allen in the dugout at Chicago's uh, uh, Comiskey Park. Uh, the picture actually shows up on the cover of Jet Magazine from August 3, 1972. And it me, captures a picture of um, Dick Allen uh, in arguably his greatest season of his 15 year big league career. Um, over the previous three seasons, he had played for three different clubs. Um, he had a bit of a tarnished reputation, but in 72, uh, he put together this incredible season uh, and thrilling White Sox fans. Um, and he won the American League uh, Most Valuable Player Award. He led the league with 37 homers, 113 RBIs, and a 603 slugging percentage. Just a great season and a great photo portrait. I quickly fell in love with this wonderful action photo from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Uh, it shows the Springfield Sally's Renee Youngberg as she's awaiting a throw at third base, while Chicago Collins runner Joe Sindelar scampers back to the bag. This is in 1949. I love the intensity and the naturalness of the photo. Just for a moment, do me a favor, take a look at this photograph and forget about the fact that these are women playing baseball. Just see them as baseball players because that's what they are. They are quite simply great baseball players. Um, I wanted to pair this photo with a quote that would really provide a contrast with that concept. And uh, I found one from nearly 70 years before the photo was taken in the March 20, 1880 issue of a New York-based theater and sports uh, weekly titled the New York Clipper. And the quote reads as follows. There are some things women can't do. The teachings of centuries have established the fact that a woman can't play baseball. None but a perverted and bald-headed advocate of female suffrage would permit the assumption to dally in his mind that a woman could throw a ball underhand or attempt to catch one without shutting both eyes just when she could see biggest. 
Our mind is made up as unchangeable as Plymouth Rock, that though a woman may, may rule the universe, she can't play baseball, end quote. Well, the uncredited author of the statement is wrong on two accounts. First of all, Plymouth Rock is not at all unchangeable. In fact, it changes quite a bit. It's changed quite a bit over the years. It's been moved. It's been split into two. It's been put back together. So the idea of Plymouth Rock being unchangeable is a fallacy. And of course, the second one is women, of course, can play ball. And as plainly seen in this photograph, Renee Youngberg has her eyes wide open as she's about to make this play. Now, last year uh, marked uh, the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Negro National League in the year 1920, the first successful Negro League and today recognized as a major league along with six other leagues that unlike their white counterparts, allowed players to take part in the game they loved regardless of the color of their skin. Now, uh, when we happened upon this wonderful photograph um, that we had earmarked for the exhibit, uh, we knew very little about it. We knew it was a Negro National League club, St. Louis Giants. Uh, some people thought it was a Stars. It's not, it's a St. Louis Giants. But that was about all that was known. But I thought this image would afford us a great opportunity to talk a bit about the level of research that goes into um, uh, every photograph that was in the exhibit and the book, and frank, quite frankly, in the museum. Uh, we put a lot of work into really understanding objects before we display them to the public, you know, both in the exhibit, however we do it. So I asked some questions and I uh, found some answers happily. First question was, where was the photo taken? Well, if you zoom in on the billboard in the background, you can see it says Midwest National Bank and Trust, and a little bit harder to see at the bottom says Grand at Night. Well, that matches the location of a bank by that same name, and at that location found in an early 1920s city directory for Kansas City, Missouri. So I know the photo is most likely taken in Kansas City. So we're going to go along that assumption and ask when was the photo taken. And happily, there is a billboard in the back, excuse me, a scoreboard in the background. And if you zoom in on the scoreboard, you can see partial line scores and team names. So for example, you can see uh, the and ends of the words Indianapolis and Kansas City, and uh, part of the line score, but at the far right, you see the final score was two to one with Indianapolis winning. That occurred um, on an exact date. And the Brooklyn beating Cincinnati uh, in Brooklyn, nine to seven, that's near the very bottom there. You can barely see a little bit of it. And on the far right, you can see the final score. And in the Negro National League, the Kansas City Monarchs, the main uh, part of the scoreboard at the bottom, um, beat the St. Louis Giants seven to five. So that photo was taken in, in June of 20, excuse me, of, of um, 1920. And in what park would the Negro National League Kansas City Monarchs have played St. Louis Giants? The answer is Association Park. But I wanted to corroborate that this is really where the photo was taken. So I looked it up and I found that Association Park Center Field was at the corner of Prospect and East 20th Street in Kansas City. And then I went to uh, zoom in on this part of the uh, center field beyond the um, advertisements in the outdoor wall. And you can see an interesting building with two chimneys and uh, distinctive uh, windows. And then I did a little walk on Google Street View, and I found the very same building at the same location, Prospect and East 20th Street. The double chimneys matching up. Of course, the building has changed a bit. Uh, the little wooden offshoot in the original is now gone, but it's clearly the same structure. So I knew I was at the right ballpark as well. Who took the photo? Well, at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see uh, the photo, it says photo by J.E. Miller, KC. Well, once again, looking at a city director, city directory, I was able to find James E. Miller, a black photographer who, according to a city directory, like this one here, was based in Kansas City at 1622 East 18th Street. And that is located right here in the corner of 18th Street and Highland. Uh, you can see the 1622 there, a little pink denoting an office there. But remarkably, the block that's shown at the top part of that inset between Vine and Highland, north of 18th Street, is today the very site of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. 
I was astounded when I saw this. And then I thought, well, maybe this was done on purpose uh, uh, because, um, you know, this guy, James Miller, actually took a number of early Negro League photos. So I contacted the Negro League Museum and they were absolutely astonished that that was the case. It's a total coincidence that this photographer is actually at the location of the Negro League Museum now. What a wonderful surprise. Now, not all of this information made it into the book. Actually, very little of it made it to the book in the exhibit. But I needed to know as much as I could about the image. Um, and, I, and that's true of every photo. Uh, in order to truly understand them and write a, an informed caption. As I mentioned, all of the photos underwent this kind of rigorous research. And um, but that's the only way that we can really tell these interesting, engaging, educational, entertaining stories about them. Well, when looking for photographs to include in the exhibit and later in the book, our goal was not to choose the most famous photos, the photos of the greatest moments, photos of the greatest players. Um, this is not a book full of superlatives in terms of, you know, a, a top of 100 or top of 150 or whatever. Instead, our goal was to choose a wide range of photographs, different subjects, different eras, different uh, styles. In short, we wanted to make sure that there was a variety in almost any way we can to define the word variety. Um, so that was our goal. Additionally, though, we want to make sure of two overriding goals. And that was where the photographs had to quite simply be excellent, not run of the mill. And the photographs had to lend themselves to a great story or stories. And this photo, like the others in the exhibit in the book, does that job. Great photo, great story. It was taken by Brad Manchin, who I believe is in our virtual audience today, a veteran pro photographer from the Bay Area in San Francisco, who's also a longtime friend of the Hall of Things. And uh, I should mention, by the way, another great photographer from the Bay Area uh, who's apparently joining us in this virtual audience is Doug McWilliams. And we also feature a number of his photos in this book. So welcome to both of those guys. Of course, this image shows the wonderful, entertaining, and from the batter's point of view, terribly confusing windup of Hideo Nomo. Well, uh, I paired this um, photo with a great quote from Tom Verducci of Sports Illustrated when he described the motion of Hideo Nomi during his rookie season of 1995. And Verducci called it, quote, an explosion of leg spinning, back bending, head turning, arm whipping contortions. Uh, but Brad didn't just shoot any Nomo game. This was Hideo Nomo's first major league game, May 2, 1995. And on that day, this 26-year-old from Osaka, Japan, became the first Japanese pitcher in the majors since Matsunori Murakami in the mid-1960s. Well, in order to capture the essence of Nomo's unique delivery, Brad moved all around the park in an effort to capture almost every angle of the pitcher who's famously known as the human tornado. Brad started off in center field. He moved his way over to the upper deck behind home. Then he went over to the field level behind third, and he finally ended up here behind home plate where he captured this wonderful shot using the Fujicom 100 color slide film. And not all the photographs in the book or in the exhibit feature major leaguers or even minor leaguers. Um, we feature children playing baseball, fans in the stands, baseball in the military, college ball clubs, classic and obscure ballparks, Broadcasters, umpires, writers, equipment, the list goes on and on. Any way you can think of baseball, and probably a lot of ways you don't think about baseball, we tried to capture in this book. Well, here we have a 1924 team photograph of the Big Ben Blues, which is a factory team. Um, here they are gathered on the front steps of the company's office building in Middlesboro, Kentucky. Well, the Big Ben factory manufactured denim overalls, and what's especially wonderful about the team and in this photo is that the uniforms were made of blue denim. There's no way that these were made by a third party company like Spalding or Reach, which supplied lots of baseball uniforms throughout the country. You just know these were made by the Big Ben factory workers at the Big Ben factory itself. Well, for decades, factory leagues were popular throughout the country. They provided camaraderie amongst workers, uh, bonding, um, entertainment for uh, the locals in the towns and cities. Um, this particular club, for example, faced off against other factory teams like the Union Tanning Company, uh, the Jellicoe Coal Company, Southern Railway teams. So um, they had lots of competition at that level. 
Another thing I love about this photograph is that modern day photographs tend to have um, that are team photographs. I tend to find fairly boring. They they are just fairly set, uh, two or three rows of players just staring into the camera. But here, and especially in these early days, um, there's a real charm to the way the photos are composed. The perfectly symmetrical positioning of the team members, uh, their baseball equipment is carefully positioned. Um, they really made an effort when posing for the photo and the photographer made an effort as well to make a perfect composition. And I love that effort. Now this is a panoramic photograph of a ball, a ballpark that was brand new when the photo was taken. It's Terrapin Park in Baltimore, and it is opening day of the park and opening day of the Federal League season, April 13, 1914. Well, the Federal League began in 1913, the previous year, as a minor league operation. But after that season ended, the uh, organization raided the contracts of the National American Leagues, and they sent a lot of big name stars like Chief Bender and uh, Three Finger Brown, Eddie Plank, Joe Tinker, just to name a few stars. And they proclaimed themselves a third major league at war with the other leagues. Well, the Federal League lasted just two seasons and then collapsed. Baltimore had last had a major league club in 1902. Uh, so the city was excited to host big league baseball for the first time in a dozen years. And nearly 30,000 fans overwhelmed the stands at uh, the ballpark as Baltimore hosted Buffalo. And even though the part Peking saw a three to two win by their home team, I'm here to tell you that each and every one of these 30,000 Pekings made a huge mistake going to the game that day. So let me explain. The first baseline at this park parallels Baltimore's East 29th Street. It's just west of Greenmount Avenue. Well, on the other side of East 29th Street was another baseball park. You can't see it here, but trust me, on the other side of the stands, there's a ballpark. That was the old Orioles Park that was the home of the Baltimore Orioles of the International League. Well, at the time, the International League had not yet started their season. That was going to be in a couple of weeks. And neither had the American or National League. The Federal League was getting a jump on the other leagues by starting their season early. But a game did take place at Oriole Park this same day at this same time. The New York Giants were barnstorming their way north from their spring training home in Marlin, Texas, uh, which is actually incidentally where that photo was taken of the 1913 Giants I showed you earlier. And so as they barnstormed their way north up to New York, they scheduled a game along the way against the Orioles as part of the trip home. Um, so despite the draw of the New York Giants, uh, which was the previous season's National League pennant, it was, a, it was a great ball club, only 3,000 fans attended that Giants-Orioles exhibition game. Well, those who failed to attend the game missed the chance to see stars like Chief Myers and Christy Matheson, and incidentally Jim Thorpe, who just two years earlier had won a pair of gold medals in both the decathlon and pentathlon at the Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden. But even more crushing in hindsight is pitching for the Orioles that day was a 19 year old kid gearing up for his first season in pro ball. His name was George Herman Babe Ruth. So when you really look back on it, the 30,000 fans seen here, they all went to the wrong game. This next photo was taken about a quarter of a century earlier than the Baltimore panoramic. This is an image that was augmented with some information, uh, a handwritten identification at the bottom and a copyright notice, sort of uh, about a third of the way up from the bottom. Um, and the handwriting uh, shows that, that um, the copyright is for the Goodwin and Company. It's a New York based company, manufacturer of cigarettes that were known as Gypsy Queen cigarettes and old judge cigarettes. Well, in the second half of the 1880s, the company began inserting small cardboard images of ball players, such as this one, in their packages of cigarettes as a way to uh, keep the packages stable, but also as an enticing giveaway. And even though baseball cards had been around for a little while prior to this time, these, uh, what were known as old judge cards, um, mm -hmm. helped pave the way for a collecting hobby that's still passionately practiced well over a dozen decades later. This card shows future Hall of Famer Ned Hamlin with Pittsburgh of the National League, or so it would seem. 
actually Hamlet played for Pittsburgh in just one year, 1889. But you'll notice the copyright date here says 1887. So which is it? Well, you do your research and you find out that the uniform matches that worn by the Detroit Wolverines in 1887. That's the team he played for in 87, even though it says Hamlin with Pittsburgh. So what we're really seeing is Hamlin with Detroit in 1887. And what happened was rather than having Goodwin and company take a second photograph in 1889 in a different uniform, they just used the old photo. They recycled that old image, they changed the writing on it, and they passed it off as a brand new card. And this is not unique to the Hamlin card. It was done dozens upon dozens of times in this very large set of baseball cards. But what I really love about this photo is that it captures Hamlin as he prepares to catch a ball or so it would seem. If you do a close up, you'll see that the baseball is actually dangling by a string. It's not being photographically captured mid flight. Now, studios of this era often use this or other kind of tricks like painted backdrops, which is what we saw, or faux grass. We saw him standing on a rug that looks like grass in an effort to make up for the fact that or with early photo technology, uh, they can't have mo um, uh, motion. That it has, the, the subject has to stand still for a decent amount of time. So these attempts at making it look like an action photograph met with a certain amount of success, but they didn't do a very good job of cleaning up this photo to sort of hide the fact there's a string there. Um, it's a dead giveaway that the uh, photo was staged, but it's a lot of fun from the point of view today. Well, fast forward, and I do mean fast, uh, a century, and things have changed quite a bit. Ron Vesely, who was a longtime White Sox photographer, took this quintessential image of Ricky Henderson, capturing him as he speeds off to second base, something that Ricky had done thousands upon thousands of times during his 25 year big career. What's remarkable about Ricky Henderson is his total number of stolen bases is 1,406. That's 468 more stolen bases than the literal runner up. Lou Brock with 938. Think of it this way. If you only count those bases that Ricky stole after passing Brock, those 468 bases, Ricky would still be in the top 50 for career stolen bases. Or here's another way to think of it. On the baseball dime, the bases are set 90 feet apart, right? Well, for each of Ricky's 1,406 stolen bases, that means he advanced about 90 feet. If you do the math, you get that just around 126,000 feet were covered by Ricky Henderson stealing bases. That's nearly 24 miles. In other words, just looking at Ricky's stolen bases, he nearly completed a marathon, sliding head first every 13 steps. Well, while catchers had no time uh, to uh, stop Henderson on the base paths, photographer Ron Vesley didn't have that problem because of all the advances in photo and camera technology. Faster cameras, more powerful lenses, allow photographers to move out of their studios, onto the playing pool field, and ultimately into special boxes and pits made just for photographers. Once again, talking about how baseball and photography work together. Today, action photographers use digital cameras, have super fast shutter speeds, and very sensitive light sensors to freeze the action, capturing the intensity of the moment, in the smallest fraction of a second. Um, in a short story called Shoeless Joe, which was later adapted to a movie we all know called Field of Dreams, author W.P. Kinsella said, a ballpark at night is more like a church than a church. I felt that quote paired wonderfully with this photograph taken by one of the most celebrated sports photographers of all time, Hi Peskin. In 1946, Peskin took this image of a cozy nighttime baseball church for an article that was published the following year in an issue of Look Magazine, uh, having to do with the road to ba baseball's big leagues. In this case, the road went through a game under the lights at Elm Park in Oneonta, New York, which is a small town located just a couple dozen miles south of Cooperstown, which is an even smaller town. Um, today, the park is called Damaschi Field. And just as in 1946, it stands as a quintessential example of America's love for grassroots baseball. And I love that, thankfully, High Peskin preserved this picture of it from, what are we talking about, uh, almost 75 years ago. I guess it is 75 years ago. 
Now, this is another photo that showcases a ballpark, this time as a backdrop uh, to a pair of champion baseball clubs. This is the Messer Street ground in Providence, Rhode Island on September 30, 1879. And posing on the field for uh, a photographer who remains unidentified are at the right, the hometown 1879 pennant winning Providence Grays, and at the left, the previous season's champs, the Boston Red Stockings, who are today known as the Atlanta Braves, not the Boston Red Sox, but they moved to become the, the Atlanta Braves because they went through Boston, changing their name to the Boston Braves, then the Milwaukee Braves, and now Atlanta Braves. Well, there are four future Hall of Famers captured in this early on-field photograph. That's John Ward, a couple of guys over is Jim O'Rourke. Down on the ground there below Jim O'Rourke is George Wright, and seated with the cane in his hand is George Wright's older brother, Harry Wright. But let's take a close look at this photograph as it reveals some other cool stuff. For example, right here is the chalk outline pitcher's box. Uh, and the pitcher's box is a feature that predates the pitcher's mound. As a matter of fact, you can see that this area is very flat. There's no mound at all. But the pitcher's box also explains why we still use the phrase of a pitcher getting knocked out of the box or a shot that goes right up the middle is a shot through the box. There's no box there now, but there was a box when those phrases first came about. Take a close look and you'll see at each corner of the box is a little circle. These things are called pitcher's points and they were essentially giant thumbtacks that um, were uh, hammered into the ground. And um, what they would do is they would uh, connect each one of these pitcher's points to its neighbor with uh, some chalk. Well, the pitcher's box has changed a number of times. The dimensions changed, the location changed. But in 1879, when this photo was taken, this is the first time a change had been made, been made in a decade. The old size was six by six feet. This is the new size, a little bit narrower, four by six feet long. It was not until 1893 that the box was abandoned uh, and removed from the rules of the game. And that was the season that the pitcher's rubber was introduced with a pitcher moving back to 60 feet, six inches from home, his foot having to remain on that rubber. But at this time, you could do whatever you wanted to as long as you deliver the ball within that box. Um, and the front of the box was just 45 feet from home. Don't let anyone tell you the ball was coming in nice and easy. 45 feet from home, and uh, even though it was restricted to be underhand, you could still whip it in there pretty tough. And there's home. And you'll notice that it is not the familiar five-sided figure that it is today. In the, in the earliest days of organized baseball, it was actually a circle. Here, it is a square because in 1868, it changed into a square with one point facing the pitcher, one point facing where the catcher would be. And it wasn't until 1900 that it changed into this new five-sided figure that we're familiar with today. Another thing that I love about this photograph is it captures a building in the, on the right-hand side beyond the, uh, the stands there. Um, and that's a that building's at the corner of Messer Street and Willow Street. And it's a, just a beautiful, majestic structure. It was the Messer Street Primary School, a two-story mansard roof brick building that had built, been built just four years before this photo was taken. Here's a postcard of that very same building from almost the same uh, angle. But when I discovered that this building was a school, I just, it just thrilled me. I couldn't help but to imagine that back in the 1870s, elementary school children might sneak out of their classroom, run to the windows and look down to the park in an effort to catch a glimpse of one of their heroes in the ball field. The building was saved in 1994. It was in a very bad condition, but it was saved and now provides housing for develop, develop, excuse me, developmentally challenged adults. Um, but the park itself is gone, but thankfully it lives on forever in this photograph. Now, of course, games at Messer Street Grounds would have been played during the daytime, but today the vast majority of big league games are played at night. And the rarity of day games was just one of the many reasons I was drawn to this wonderful photograph taken by Cooperstown native and official Hall of Fame photographer Miles Stewart Jr. We feature a number of his photos in the book. Not only is it a superb photograph, but it also allows us to talk about how baseball established itself as our national game when it was solely a daylight pastime. 
Baseball under the lights had been experimented with at very low levels of the game and the sport as far back as the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1930, with a country in the throes of the Great Depression, that the Kansas City Monarchs introduced night baseball to the Negro National League. And it was another five years before the white major leagues followed suit. Milo took this wonderful photo. In my opinion, it's a modern classic at Philadelphia Citizens Bank Park on June 16, 2006. Well, Picturing America's Past, as I mentioned, is a book of baseball photography. So I felt it was very important to include at least one image of the photographers themselves. As it turns out, we actually feature a few pictures of the photographers. Uh, this is one of them. And this shot captures sort of a scramble of photographers covering the 1956 World Series at Brooklyn's Ebbets Field. And the scene was captured by Cuban native Osvaldo Salas. Well, during the 1950s, Salas served as photographer for various Spanish language newspapers and magazines in New York and Cuba and other Latin American countries. His baseball work captured uh, sort of the heyday of baseball in New York and Brooklyn during the 50s when the Yankees and the Giants and the Dodgers were each just dominant clubs. I really love this photograph of these men at work. When I came upon it, I thought it was just a little masterpiece. The position of the men are echoing the, uh, the classic roof line of Ebbets Field. Their cameras are in their hands. Some are waiting, some are preparing their cameras, some are shooting, some are moving on. Um, I just knew it was gonna make the cut for the book. That was not a problem at all. But when I really dove into the picture in order to write a caption, I was shocked to find a hidden gem. Take a look, the gentleman squatting at left in the overcoat, maintaining a firm grip on his Graflex camera is none other than Barney Stein, the official photographer for the Dodgers from 1937 to 1957 when the Dodgers left to go to Los Angeles. It was just a look, it was like icing on the cake for this quintessential photograph of photographers to have this great photographer in there. We had never realized it was him. Now, for exactly half a year from October 20, 1888 through April 20 of 1889, an entourage of over 30 different individuals toured the world playing baseball at most every stop. The tourists began in Chicago. They barnstormed their way to California. They sailed to Hawaii, which was at the time called the Sandwich Island. They continued on to New Zealand and Australia. And they later played baseball in exotic locales like Sri Lanka, which was then called Ceylon. And Paris, they went throughout the British Isles. And then they eventually returned to the States and ultimately barnstormed on their way back to Chicago. And yes, they even played in the desert just west of Cairo, Egypt. Prior to this photo taken on February 9th, 1889, uh, actually, the, the, the photo was taken. And then after that photo, um, they played a game of baseball on a makeshift diamond near the pyramids. Um, the tour organizers, there's newspaper correspondents. Uh, ball players, hangers on, they're all uh, all over um, the Great uh, Sphinx, uh, climbing up there, which is something that you absolutely can't do today. You can't even get close to the Sphinx. But at this point, they could clamber up almost to the very top. Here's what 19th century baseball star Cap Anson had to say about the moment in his autobiography. Excuse me, his autobiography. And this is the quote that we paired with this photo. After visiting the big pyramids and the Sphinx and having our pictures taken in connection with these wonders of the world, we passed down to the hard sands of the desert where a diamond had been laid out and where in the presence of fully a thousand people, we began the first and only game of ball that the great sentinels of the desert ever looked down upon. I love that quote. And at the center of the photo, uh, standing on sort of some uh, stone structure there with a pith helmet on his head, is the mastermind and the money, by the way, behind the tour, Albert Spaulding. For us today, one of Spaulding's greatest decisions was to make sure that along the way, his touring ball players were photographed as they toured the world. Thank goodness he made that decision. And I thought I'd end our tour of some of these photos featured in Picturing America's Pastime with this gorgeous picture of Chrissy Matheson by acclaimed baseball photographer, Charles C. Conley. It's a perfect pairing. Matheson is recognized by many as the game's greatest pitcher, and Conlon is recognized by many as the game's greatest photographer. In this photograph, Conlon masterfully captures this you know, incomparable figure, Christian Matheson. He's standing alone on the field at New York's iconic polo grounds 
1911. And at the time the photo was taken, Matthewson and the Polo Grounds both really were the New York Giants. The season of 1911 was the ninth of a dozen, excuse me, a dozen straight campaigns in which Maddie notched 20 or more victories. And it was the first of three straight pennants captured by his club. Um, a decade after Matheson died tragically at the age of 45, sports writer Grantland Rice wrote about Matheson in the New York Sun. And this is the quote that we chose to pair with this photo. There was only one Maddie, only one. For Chrissy Matheson of the New York Giants was something more than one of the game's greatest pitchers. He brought class and character to baseball beyond all others. For a combined mixture of brains, courage, and skill, he stood alone. I love how in this photograph by Conlon, he stands alone at the polar bands. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this sort of sneak peek at just a few of the photos in our new book, Picture America's Cast Time. It's over 300 pages long, so there's lots, lots more to enjoy. To purchase the book, you can visit our museum shop in person, or you can order online at shop.baseballhall.org. And if you're interested in having the traveling exhibit version of the exhibit come to your home, um, it's a, whether it's a museum in your hometown or a library or a historical society, or quite frankly, any, anywhere else for that matter, please contact, contact us. Uh, we're at baseballhall.org slash picturing, and that will give you information about the traveling exhibit. Thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna post those uh, um, that information in our chat session so you can find out uh, those links and uh, hand it back to Bruce. All right, Tom, that was very interesting. A um, lot of photos I'd never seen before. And we, as you might imagine, got several questions uh, that have come in. Uh, one is from a gentleman named Mike. And it's actually a picture that uh, photo I was very uh, curious about. It's the photograph of the Springfield Sallies where we see the runner heading back into third base. Right. What about the people in the outfield? <laughs> what were they doing there? <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, it's a little bit of a mystery as to what's going on because there's people walking in the outfield and uh, it's not clear to me what's going on. Uh, my best guess is this may not be actually game action. It may be practice and, and, yeah. that, and that there was people walking around because, yeah, they're just like, <laughs> they're just out in the outfield um, and it's kind of fun. There's little... Um, Tom, can we go back to that photo? Can we show it again? It's hard to get back to that. Uh, let's see if I can quickly zoom there. Uh, bear with me because this may take a little bit okay. of work here, but let's see if I can. I'm not sure I can get it to go back. Oh, here we go. So let's go zooming back to all these pictures. Pardon me. And pass all this research. There we are. So yes, you can see people in the background there uh, in short left field. <laughs> It looks like they're going for a stroll through the park. Yes. They're completely oblivious to what's going on. Yeah. Good good eyes out there. And actually, if you, you know, this is the wonderful thing about this, uh, about baseball photographs. One of the reasons I love it so much, and you'll find this in the exhibit, and you'll find it in the book. Pay attention. You know, uh, look, look everywhere in a picture, and there's just more joy and more fun to, um, to, uh, uh, to bring in, um, by, by paying attention to all of the photo, not just the obvious subject matter. Tom, I was curious about the photo of Ned Hanlon. You pointed out how the ball was on a string. Right. Uh, what about the fact that he was making the play, pretending to make the play barehanded? I believe that was 1880s. Was it still common for players to not use gloves at that point? It was common, but, but players were, were already experimenting with gloves. Um, and the first place that you see gloves showing up uh, is actually the two most obvious spots, the people that are going to be doing the most amount of catching balls. Those are the catcher. I mean, we call them the catcher after all, right? Not a surprise. And first baseman, right? Those are the guys that are going to be doing the most amount of catching. And that's where the baseball gloves first really started showing up. Um, and yes, by this time, there were people wear, definitely wearing gloves and often on two hands. They were usually fingerless gloves, so you could still grip with either hand. Um, so if you look at some of these other old judge cards, you'll find, uh, early baseball gloves. And so once again, pay attention to the photos and you can learn a lot about baseball history, but you can also enjoy a beautiful photograph. All right. Glinda has several questions in the 1879 photo of Boston and Providence. 
who are the gentlemen seated in the background? Okay, so let's go here. Oh, hey, we'll, we'll zoom there. And uh, we'll try to zoom there. Here we go. And you can see them seated here. And the answer is, I don't know who they are, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, I'm, ass I'm assuming they're probably officials, uh, ex executives with the club. The um, reason this photo was taken was um, the uh, Providence had just clinched the pennant. And happily, they happened to clinch it right when the previous pennant winners, the Boston Red Seconds, were in town. So that was a wonderful little coincidence. Uh, and it's end of the season, September 30th of 1879. But uh, this gentleman to, I think my mouse doesn't show up on the screen, but the gentleman to um, George, excuse me, Harry Wright's right, or the, you know, from the, the, our point of view, the left of Harry Wright seated with his family. That gentleman is actually the umpire. So, but the guys in the background, I'm not sure. Okay, Glenda has a follow-up question. Is the wooden crate to the right of the men where the players kept their bats? Yeah, that's right. Okay. See, we have lots of great eagle eye uh, yeah. participants here, and I, I love that. Yep, that is the, the bats, and actually the bench that they're, that they're on, which is what can seat maybe four tightly, right? Three, yeah. three uh, at this point, and maybe two during a pandemic. Uh, it's a small yeah. bench, right? Yeah. But at this point, it was required to provide a bench for both clubs. You can see there's one on the left side and one on the right side. That was a requirement under the rules. Now, of course, we know about dugouts and uh, and obviously it seems like a crazy place to sit, right? But uh, it, very few uh, injuries were, were uh, ever occurred with uh, players being hit. And of course you couldn't have the whole team sitting there. So, but that was a requirement actually. So no dugouts at this point in time? No, at this point in time, no. All right, uh, let's see what else we've got here uh, as we move ahead. Uh, Perry Barber, who was previously a guest, the umpire, who's uh, one of our faithful viewers. Will Picturing America's Pastime also have an exhibit at the Hall of Fame or will it be strictly a travel exhibit? Is there a schedule yet? Well, I know the answer to the first question. There is an exhibit. Tom, you can answer more about that in detail and you can also tell us about a schedule if there is one yet. Yeah, so Perry, there, the the um, exhibit, uh, like I said, opened in 20, what did I say, uh, 2013 or 14, I can't remember now. It's been a long time, I think 2013. Uh, yeah, we started working on it in 2012. It opened in 2013, in November of 2013. And it's been on exhibit since then. And uh, it is still on exhibit. Uh, it's actually moved. We've, we've, it used to be on our third floor, now it's on our second floor, but it's still there. Uh, from a, the traveling exhibit does not have a such schedule. So when various institutions get a hold of us and say, hey, we'd like to bring it to, to us, then uh, it'll go there. And so if you go to um, the address that I gave, once again, it's baseballhall.org slash picturing, that will take you to a website that's all about the exhibit uh, and the book, but that particular page that it'll go straight to, it talks about how to contact us if you want the traveling exhibit to come to your hometown. So I encourage you to do that. It's not very expensive. Um, and uh, um, it's gone to, it's been in Los Angeles, it's been in Hot Springs, Arkansas, it's been down in Florida. So it's moved around. And uh, so I, I hope that it continues to travel because it's a wonderful exhibit. Very good. Our friend Hannah Soltis wants to know, how does the Hall of Fame acquire photographs for the archives? And how has this changed with today's digital world? And Hannah was a former intern, right? That's right, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for tuning in, Hannah. and, and uh, the answer is that photographs are acquired uh, just like every, every other object is acquired at the Hall of Fame. They come in through donations. And um, sometimes they come in huge numbers. Uh, we've had entire uh, newspaper, what they call morgue, uh, morgue files, where you have literally thousands upon thousands of pictures coming in. And they also come in one by one. A person would contact us and say, hey, I have a particular photo. Would you be interested in it? And uh, we have an accessions committee that makes these decisions. It's always a group decision, never one individual who decides these things. And um, so they come in to the generosity of fans and organizations and clubs, et cetera. And yes, we do have digital images. And uh, um, so uh, those come in as well. I know that uh, uh, Brad Manchin, I mentioned, shoots digitally. Ron Vesely shoots digitally. 
Uh, and, and originally they did not, so we have a little bit of a mix of their, of their photographs, but um, yes, we get lots of digital images as well. Hannah's gonna kill me for saying this, but uh, when Hannah was here, she filled out a questionnaire like all the other interns did, uh, giving us a funny anecdote about their, you know, their lives. And Hannah mentioned that when she was a baby, her babysitter, believe it or not, was actress Betsy Palmer, who is perhaps best known for being <laughs> in the first Friday the 13th film. And I'm not making that up. That is the absolute truth, so. Yeah, that's, and, and, and she's made it. She's made it this far, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, another follow-up from Perry Barber, I believe, on the Springfield. Sally's was it? I'm, I'm not sure which picture she's referring to. She says the first base woman's foot is not on the back. I guess she's referring to the Springfield picture. Well, sure. in the photo of the of uh, the Chicago Colony in Springfield, Sally, the Renee Youngberg is third baseman. Third so base. She's, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, so she doesn't have to have her foot in the bag because it's not a force play. The runner is returning uh, okay. to third base after having moved towards home. So her only hope is to uh, to get a tag. So it's all about getting the ball. Tom, do we have just a couple of minutes left? Uh, I'm curious about the selection process. Uh, we have, what is it, over 300,000 photographs in our collection. How in the world were you able to boil that down to right. a relatively smaller list? And I'm curious about the ratio between black and white and color. Was that something that you were conscious of or you just wanted outstanding pictures regardless of the color? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, the first question is how do you go through a quarter million images? Um, and the answer is you don't. So we can't go through every single picture. So we do it in uh, sort of a, uh, a very focused um, searching. Now that doesn't mean that I didn't go through many images. I went through a lot of images, both for the exhibit, mostly me and Jenny on that, and then in trying to expand the group for the larger um, selection for the book. Um, I was pretty much solo doing that. And I uh, looked at a lot of photos. Um, but yes, we can't do a quarter million. So I would target it. Um, of course, one of the, the things we had to make sure we, we could do was that we had um, the uh, copyright ability and the, the rights issues. And that wid uh, winnowed down the possible photos um, a decent amount. So I wasn't going to look into photos that would not be, you would not be able to uh, reproduce. Um, from a standpoint of color and black and white, um, you know, when you go through the book, you're going to see that it's organized in a way that seems uh, pretty random. It's not in chronological order or it's not in alphabetical order or anything like that it looks like sort of a hodgepodge. We didn't want to have, a, the organizational structure was what I said earlier, we're gonna have quotes and we're gonna have labels and we're gonna have photos and that's what's gonna be in common. But otherwise we're gonna mix it up. So you'll see something new and different and unexpected. Um, there's not a section to just go to the portraits or a section to just go to the action photos. But we really did try very, very hard to make sure there was a wide variety. So it wasn't gonna all be team photos. It wasn't gonna be all, uh, action photos it wasn't going to be all color photos or all black and white, even though the vast majority of baseball history was shot in black and white. Um, so there are more black and white photos uh, in this photo than color, but that's that reflects uh, not only the history of baseball and photography, but also reflects the situation with our collection. Tom, color photography in baseball, when did it become common? Was it the 60s, the 70s? Yeah, I mean, that's a, basically the, the 60s is when it was really taking off. Um, there's color photography well before that, but but uh, from a standpoint of really making the, the, the switch, uh, the 60s is a big part. I mean, but still in the 1970s and even in the 1980s, lots of photos going over that are wire service photos were still black and white. Remember, a lot of photographs were taken strictly for newspaper printing and newspapers were even well into the 80s were often printing in black and white. They would have maybe a color section. Um, and so the there was less of a necessity for the color. But then, you know, once again, starting in the 60s and 70s, things started to, to transition. But you'd still have black and white photography and you still have great black and white photography today. Yeah, you know, there's something about those black and white photos that uh, I, I just love them. And they just, for some reason, they're so fitting for baseball. I like the color too, but 
there is something stately, uh, maybe nostalgic about uh, black and white. So it does work very well. Uh, Tom, any final comments, any final thoughts that you want to make people aware of in terms of uh, how to get the book and what's uh, what's the best procedure? Uh, the book technically is coming out in June, but it can be pre-ordered, correct? It can be pre-ordered. And I uh, I believe that it may be actually available uh, at our website and uh, in our bookstore sooner than the the official uh, opening date of mid June. Um, so, yeah, I, I, what I would say is this: I encourage you to come to Cooperstown and see these photos. They're very large format. We reproduced them quite large, and that's it's really stunning. But if you want to see about three times the number of photographs uh, and bring the, the exhibit home to you and um, you know, have it at your fingertips wherever you want. Um, definitely get the book. Um, it's uh, it's over 300 pages of images and um, and great information. And if you like the stories that I shared today, you're going to love the book. Well, great job, Tom. We really do appreciate it. Again, if you'd like to get the book, go to our website. Go to shop.baseballhall.org. Again, that's shop.baseballhall.org. And you can then do a search for Picturing America's Pastime, and it'll take you right to the book. You can order it there. Uh, we hope you will do that. We hope you enjoy not only the photography, but as Tom says, the wonderful stories uh, behind them as well. Uh, our thanks go out to Tom Schieber and all the others who worked very hard on this book over the last year. And of course, we want to thank the Ford Motor Company for being our sponsor for this and all of our other virtual programs. Our next one is coming up in just a couple of days, later this week, Thursday, May the 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. We will talk to former Major League shortstop Rico Petroselli. Well, he played shortstop and third base for the Boston Red Sox. He was on their 67 and 75 pennant winning teams. And he'll talk about his book on All-Stars Cardboard Memories. Again, that's coming up uh, Thursday, May 27th at 2 p.m. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today here in Cooperstown. Have a great day, everyone.